Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and welcome to seminar number two of my series, which is a one-year series. I'm doing uh, one seminar a month called Elder Law 101. This is really meant to talk about any issues that you may be facing um, as you get older. Uh, so in, in, I'm doing, just once again, as a quick recap, I'm doing uh, 12 seminars. This month's seminar is about things to consider in your 60s. Last month, in my intro, I just kind of talked about broadly what uh, estate planning issues you would typically consider before you were 60. Uh, they included talking about revocable trusts, making sure you had a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy in place because you need those documents at any age. This time I'm gonna talk about folks in their 60s. Next month I'm gonna focus on pe people in their 70s. At that point, you may be having more health problems, you may be thinking about moving, you may be starting to get more worried about what happens if I need a nursing home later on. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to take a break and talk about um, taxes. Um, or excuse me, we're going to, that's right, we're going to talk about taxes because it's going to be April. Uh, so we're going to talk about income tax issues of all kinds. Uh, in May, we're going to talk about life in your 80s um, because there is a, set of, a special set of issues there. Then I'm going to talk about why you can always qualify for mass health. I'm going to talk about, you know, dealing with issues before you die, a number of other issues. Uh, so I hope that you get a chance to really kind of watch all of this series of presentations. But going back uh, today, I'm talking about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, and talking about how, what their issues may be in their 60s. Uh, Frank and Mary's goal has always been to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to leave everything to their kids after they're both dead. Uh, in general, if they can, they want to avoid the probate process. I talked about that a lot last month because that would have been true even if Frank and Mary were younger. But also, once Frank and Mary are in their 60s and they've accumulated more wealth, they want to make sure that they're avoiding taxes to the greatest extent possible. The same thing is true um, of, of Mary's sister Peg, whom I've introduced uh, to really, so that I can focus on someone who is single. So Mary, our, our Peg is single. Uh, she has one daughter, Peggy. Her goals are the same as Frank and Mary's. Um, depending on where they live, Frank and Mary may be in a different um, total asset situation. Frank and Mary around the Metro West area may have a house worth about $400,000. I'm, I'm assuming Frank's IRA is about $400,000. They have joint savings of $300,000, so their total assets are a million one. That same couple on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket, earning the same kind of money and having done the same kind of general work um, before they retired, are now worth about $1,700,000 because their house is worth a million. Everybody's house, not everybody's, on Nantucket, pretty much everybody's, and on Martha's Vineyard, many, many people's houses are worth a million dollars or more now. So we're, we're going to talk about um, their situation in terms of dealing with the estate tax. First, there is no federal estate tax that's going to be relevant to Frank and Mary because that estate tax only kicks in if, one of, if, they, if, if they both die and there's, there are assets worth more than $12,920,000 if they die in 19, or excuse me, in 2023. By the way, that number is portable so that if one of them dies and hasn't used that exemption, the surviving spouse gets an exemption of, of $25,800,000, this gigantic number. So that's simply not an issue. The reason why I bring up the federal estate tax system, though, is because there is also a federal gift tax. There is no Massachusetts gift tax. And as a result of that, if you give away all of your assets the day before you die, there is no gift tax, and you've now avoided the Massachusetts estate tax. At the federal level, somebody thought about that loophole and decided to plug it. So at the federal level, in addition to there being a federal estate tax, there was also a federal gift tax. Now you've all, you've all heard of that gift tax. You, you probably didn't know whether it was federal or state, but the reason why you've heard of it is because you've been told that there was some amount of money that you can give away every year to an individual, and if you give away more than that, something bad happens. Well, what, what that is referring to is the federal gift tax exclusion. The way the federal gift tax exclusion works is that if you give away money to people you owe a gift tax unless you qualify for one of the two exclusions. What are they? The first one uh, is that you can give a given amount of money in any, in any year to anybody 
except that you can't give more than a particular amount per year per person. That amount used to be $10,000. The, 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 uh, the uh, law, though, has a, uh, a, an inflation rider to it, so that number has been going up over time. That number in 2023 is actually $16,000. So you can give up to $16,000 to anybody you want, to as many people as you want, um, and, and therefore be excluded from the gift tax. And everybody knows that one. That's the first exclusion. The other one, no one knows about. And I, I emphasize this because I, th probably this is the greatest kind of in, b it, bad information that people are carrying around about their estates, right? Is this gift tax myth. So in addition to that exclusion of what is now $16,000 per, per year per person, each person has, an, has a lifetime exclusion equal to the, the estate tax exclusion, which is now $12,920,000. So unless you are planning to give away more than $12,920,000 during your lifetime or all of your gifts put together up to now plus those other gifts are going to equal that number, you're, none of that is going to be subject to the gift tax. None of it is going to be subject to the gift tax. But wait, you say, um, I, 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 if, I fi if, I, if I give away more than that $16,000 to somebody, I have to file a gift tax return, right? Well, um, here's how that works. The statute does say, the, the, the gift and estate tax statute does say that if you make a gift in excess of that, of the, of the, of the per person exclusion, that you're supposed to file a gift tax. And so if you go to an, a, uh, an income tax preparer or an accountant or anyone who's going through your, your, your income taxes for last year, they're going to say, oh, did you make any gifts of above the, what is now the $16,000 amount? And if, you, and if you tell them that you did, they're going to say, well, you have to file a gift tax return then. Well, if that happens, um, ask them what happens if you don't file the gift tax return. And what they're going to tell you is nothing, nothing. The reason for that is the only penalty for failure to file a gift tax return is a percentage of the amount of tax that you would have owed on that gift. But in this case, unless you are planning on giving over $12,920,000 over your lifetime, um, there is no tax and therefore there is no penalty. So there is no, there is no penalty for failure to file the gift tax return as a practical matter. So don't, and finally, the receipt of a gift, just like the receipt of an inheritance, is not income. So if you give a ch child of yours a million dollars this year, first of all, you're not going to have to file a gift tax return or pay a gift tax. And secondly, that child is not going to have to file any income tax return regarding that money because the receipt of a gift is not income. <clears throat> so now we come to the Massachusetts estate tax. The Massachusetts estate tax would be relevant to Frank and Mary, to either one of them, uh, if they have total assets of more than a million dollars. Before we start talking about how it's relevant though, and what they can do to avoid it, which they can given their assets, I want to talk a little bit about the system itself. So, uh, if someone dies um, leaving an estate, a taxable estate, um, they owe a gift tax. Um, if if they, if they owe a tax using one of these two formulas, right? Um, and the way that you calculate whether you owe, an, excuse me, they don't owe a gift tax, they owe an estate tax. The way you calculate whether you owe an estate tax is you figure out, figure out start, starting off, you figure out the taxable estate, and the taxable estate, as opposed to the probate estate, which only covers assets that go through the probate process, the taxable estate covers all assets that people end up getting as a result of your death over which you had control. So life insurance proceeds, for example, if, you are, if you're in the insured and, and your kids end up getting the money, that's part of the taxable estate. Uh, your IRAs, your 401ks, um, uh, trust money that you have in trust, all assets that would have a void going through the probate process are all part of your taxable estate. And the value of those assets for estate tax purposes is the date of death value. So if you die owning a house and the assessed value of the property is X, but we all know that especially in an economy that is where the values are going up, 
That number is typically much lower than the actual value. For purposes of figuring out if you owe an estate tax, you actually need to do a calculation of the actual value of that property on the date of your death. So once you've taken, done all of that, then you figure out whether you owe a tax. And the way you do that is, you, is that you look at that taxable estate and see if you owe a ta tax using two different mechanisms. First, the chart. Uh, at the time that the Massachusetts was, estate tax was created, which was around the same time the federal estate tax was created back in the 1920s, $40,000 was a lot of money. And if you, owe, if you had assets that you died with of worth more than $40,000, you owed an estate tax. Now I remember when I was first doing this work, I said to myself, $40,000, that's just not a lot of money. <clears throat> then I remembered that when my parents bought their first house, which was a two-family house in Marlboro, Massachusetts in 1940, they paid $2,000. And I remember they only could afford it because A, it was a two-family, so they had rent coming in. It wasn't a lot of rent. Uh, and, and, and B, they got a mortgage. They got a mortgage to be able to buy, to pay the $2,000. But rem so $2,000, that was the value of a two-family house in Marlboro. And at that time, uh, the estate tax kicked in if you had $40,000 or 20 th times the value of that house. Think about what your house is worth right now, $400,000, $500,000. What's 20 times that? eight million dollars, ten million dollars, you know, so, so, so the, actually the numbers aren't, aren't really that out of whack. If anything, in, as, a relation, as it relates to your, the value of your total estate, the estate tax has gone down over time. But of course you're not, you don't really care about that. So the point is to calculate your estate tax, you pull out this chart according to which, as you see, if, if, you had, if you have assets of zero to $40,000, you pay nothing. Regarding the assets between 40,000 and 90,000, you pay 0.8%. Um, between 90,000 and 140, you pay 1.6%. And each tax, it's graduated, it's just like the federal income tax. So each tax is based on, you know, the, the, the taxes on the money in that little tranche, right? So if you were doing that and you look down, the total value of Frank and Mary's uh, estate uh, if they're in the, in the Metro West area, was $1,100,000. Uh, the total, that's their total taxable estate. The total tax on that estate would be $42,640. If on the other hand, they lived on the islands and they had a total taxable estate of $1,700,000, their total tax would be $83,320. So to figure out what your estate tax is, you start off by doing what I just said, go through that exercise. Then, you look at the alternative tax, the alternative tax. So why is this here? Well, the reason is, historically, that, you know, un, kind of unsurprisingly, as time went on and real estate values started going up, more and more people who owned a house ended up having to pay an estate tax. Uh, and so eventually, and I think the first time that this went up, it was in the 1950s or 1960s, uh, people went to the legislature, the legislators, and said, "This is terrible. You know, you no, know, my parents don't have a lot of money, but but I've got we got this house, so we have to pay an estate tax." In response to that, what the legislature did was they said, rather than change the chart, which would have been too complicated, rather than change the chart, <clears throat> we're simply going to increase this threshold amount below which you do not have to pay a tax. And, and originally it was increased from $40,000 to $100,000 and later to $500,000 and later to $600,000 and eventually to a million dollars. And that, and that jump to a million dollars occurred, ooh, at this point, more than 20 years ago. And that number has not changed since. Um, now, incidentally, there is a discussion, there has been discussion, there was last year, there is this year, about increasing that threshold amount to $2 million. Uh, and if that happens, the, in, in that case, Frank and Mary's estates would not be subject to the estate tax. You must, so you may want to keep track of that. If the va value goes up to more than $2 million, then Frank and Mary's estate would still be subject to the estate tax. So anyway, today, um, that threshold number is a $1 million. And so once you've figured out the tax you would have owed under the chart, then you look at how much um, you have, how much is in the estate, the taxable estate, and you take 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. This is what some people refer to as a disappearing exclusion. A million, up to a million dollars uh, is excluded from the estate tax, is excluded 
Um, and so you don't pay any estate tax if the estate tax is less than a million. Once you're over a million though, every dollar over a million gets taxed at 40% until the amount that you're going to pay uh, ends up being higher than the amount that is listed under the ch in the chart. So, for example, Frank and Mary die with an estate of a uh, of, uh, million dollars. The chart says they're going to owe six, 36560 It's a million twenty thousand, or, or it, and, but the alternative is zero. Uh, if, they, if they die owing, owing a million twenty thousand dollars, the chart says they owe 37680 The alternative is they owe 8000 because they owe 40% of the dollars that were over a million, 40% of those $50,000, etc. So look down to a to, million two hundred thousand dollars. At a million two hundred thousand, excuse me, at a million one hundred thousand dollars. This is kind of like the cutoff. If you under the chart, you owe forty-two thousand six hundred forty dollars. Using the forty percent calculation, you owe forty thousand. So the forty thousand is still lower than the chart, right? Um, once you get higher than those numbers though that's no longer the case because 40% of the dollars that are over a million starts exceeding the amount owed under the chart. So that changes at about, at about $1,120,000. By the time you get to $1,700,000, right, um, the, 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 the difference is, is huge because 40% uh, of $700,000 um, would be $280,000, right? Um, um, the uh, or, uh, so the, the, the tax ends up being like, like gigantic, right? The, the, according to the chart, you only owe 40, in that situation, you only owe, at a hundred, at a million two hundred thousand dollars, you only owe forty nine thousand forty dollars. Using the, using the, the alternative tax, you would owe eighty thousand dollars. So after about a million one hundred fifty thousand dollars, um, the, the chart number becomes lower than the alternative tax. So basically, the exclusion that you had has disappeared. So in the case of, and, and basically, that I'm just trying to illustrate that. Um, so it, at a million dollars, your estate tax using the 40% number is zero. Your tax using um, the chart is around $48,000. The lines cross, as, as I described, um, at, at a little over, or be, between a million 100,000 and a million $125,000. So in Frank and Mary's case, um, they would owe an estate tax in either case, right? Um, in, and the question is, how can they avoid that? Well, the, the best way to avoid it is to make sure that you take advantage of the fact that if Frank or Mary had left up to a million dollars to anybody other than their spouse, um, that money would not have been that that, that would, money would not have been taxable, and so what you do is that you have each Frank and Mary each have a trust. Each of those trusts is going to say, "When I die, up to a million dollars of the assets that would have gone directly to my spouse are instead going to go in trust for the benefit of my spouse." In this case, the surviving spouse can actually be the trustee of the trust, can have total control of those assets can have the total ability to distribute those assets to himself or herself at any time without causing any kind of negative tax consequence. But for estate tax purposes, as long as those assets stay in trust, those assets will not be countable when the surviving spouse dies because the surviving spouse does not have the ability to change where those assets go after the surviving spouse dies. So, so this is the device through, it, it, through which Frank and Mary could completely avoid the estate tax. Each one would specify in their trust, if I die, up to a million dollars of the assets that were going to go into trust for the benefit of my spouse will instead be held in trust for the, bene for the, uh, for the benefit of that spouse instead of going to her, to him or her directly. If, if, we, if, you, if as a result of that, you make sure that when the surviving spouse dies, the surviving spouse has less than a million dollars in the, surviving in the surviving spouse's assets, you will have avoided the estate tax completely. By the way, the same mechanism applies even if Frank and Mary have more than $2 million between them. The effect of it would be if one of them dies and leaves up to a million dollars in that trust so that when the surviving spouse dies, the surviving spouse has more than a million, but a but million dollars less than they would have had in the absence of that trust, you basically reduce the estate tax 
by the tax that would have been owed on that, what I'll call the marginal million dollars. So this structure always works. And, it's, and for folks who are worried about the estate tax, that's the device that they want to use. Two trusts, each one revocable and amendable while the person, person whose trust it is has died. When that person dies, then the remaining assets either go directly up to a million dollars, goes into trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. The remaining assets can actually just go to the surviving spouse or, or can also go into trust. That's the way to avoid all of that. Um, next, and by the way, I, I spent a lot of time focusing on this because this is the issue that is the kind of the most concern to folks when they're in that situation. They're still concerned about avoiding probate and they're concerned about, about avoiding estate tax. In this situation, by the way, you can do them both because you can avoid probate by making sure the trusts that are being created are revocable and amendable trusts. You can avoid the tax by making sure that up to a million dollars of your assets that would have gone to the surviving spouse instead gets held in trust for the benefit of the surviving spouse. Second, and now we're going to deal with two or three other issues that are important to Frank and Mary um, in, their 70, or in their 60s. Second, dealing with Frank's tax deferred funds. Once again, uh, on the islands, their assets are a total of a million seven. Uh, in Metro West, their assets are a total of a million one. In both cases, though, Frank has this IRA worth $400,000. The question is, now he's 60, so, he, so if he pulls out any of that money, he's not paying a penalty on the money. He is, though, paying any income tax on the money that he would have pulled out. Um, if he, if he, if once he gets to 73 and a half, he's going to be required to, make, to take distributions from that IRA. If the money's in a 401k, he's going to be required to take distributions after 73 and a half unless he's still working. If he's still working and contributing to the 401k, he does not have to take distributions out of that 401k until he stops. Uh, on his death, if he's leaving everything to his spouse, then his spouse can at that point convert that money to her own IRA and therefore get that money so that it gets taken out over her lifetime. If the assets at, at Frank's death are going to anyone else than, other than the spouse, then those assets have to get taken out within the next 10 years by the surviving children or whoever you're leaving the money to. That's kind of the basic system. When should you consider early withdrawals? Well, a couple of things. First, at this point, Conversion to, from, of, of Frank's IRA money to a Roth does not cause any penalty. Um, it only causes a penalty if he's doing the conversion before he's 60 years old. Second, if he converts his money to a Roth, as a result of that conversion, he's going to have to pay the tax that would have been owed up to that point on the money that had been accumulated. But from then on in, uh, once it's converted to the Roth IRA, any a further accumulation of, of value from the Roth is not going to be taxable. So this may be the time that he wants to convert. Finally, for mass health asset protection purposes, I'm going to talk a lot more about this next month when I'm talking about Frank and Mary in their 70s. But one of the issues, if one, someone needs to qualify for mass health because they need nursing home care or need a lot of care at home, before, um, in order to avoid going to a nursing home, they can always transfer all their assets to the surviving spouse at the last minute. And then the surviving spouse, and after that, the surviving spouse can take some steps, and then you can qualify for mass health. The issue, though, is if, all of your, if you've got money in an IRA and all your money's being taken out at the same time, there could be a big income tax hit versus taking that money out gradually over time. We're gonna talk about that more um, next month, I'm also going to do a special Bergeron briefs on that issue. Um, um, so, when should you be taking your Social Security payments? Well, if you're 60, that means that your, your guaranteed full retirement age pension starts when you're 67. If you, you can start collecting Social Security at 62 um, and take your money early, except if you do, you're only going to be getting about 70% about of the money you would have gotten when you were 67. You can also delay taking your payments until you're 70. If you do that, then for every year you delay, you increase the payment by 8% so that by the time you're 70, you're actually getting 124% of what you would have gotten. If you're Frank, if Frank in this case, for example, and you would at, seven, at 67 get a, a $2,000 per month pension, if you start taking it at 62, you're only getting 1,400. If you take it at 70, you're getting 2,480. 
You really want to talk to somebody when you're in your 60s to figure this out. M most people take their pensions uh, starting right at, at 62. For many people, that's not a good idea. Um, when do you want to think about qualifying for Medicare? There are, there are several possible contingencies, but the main issue is if you're still working, you really want to weigh out what the benefit is of staying into your current plan, especially if you're only making a, a, a contribution equal to a percentage of that plan, compared to what, you're gonna, what you and your wife will pay in Part B premium, the cost of your supplement, and the cost of your Medicare Part D. Finally, once you're six, in your 60s, you may want to look at your power of attorney and your health care proxy to make sure that, A, you've named a successor in the event that your spouse can't do it, because at this point, both of you are pretty old. So if one of you is incapacitated, is a possibility the other one is too. Um, you, want, you, you, do want, you want to do this, you also want to check to see if those people, if you've got a revocable trust, can act as your successor trustee if you're incapacitated. So um, there are a lot of issues to consider if you're in your 60s. Uh, if you're specifically concerned about Medicare or about these deferred, uh, taking out your deferred con compensation money or about Social Security, you may want to watch our Bergeron briefs. Uh, in, the, in any event, if you've got any questions regarding any of this, please give me a call, 508-860-1470. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next month.